Hello everyone, my name is Dr Rachel Woods and in this lecture I will briefly be exploring the gut microbiome with you in the context of human health, so thank you very much for watching. So as I said, this is a short lecture, so I have set out a few aims and objectives of things that I would like you to hopefully get from this session. So first of all, coming away from this, it would be great if you have a good idea or a better idea of what the human gut microbiome is. And with that, the aspects of health, which we are finding out are influenced by the gut microbiome, alongside which factors determine the composition of the microbiome, as well as um, I will touch briefly upon potential um, future therapies in medicine um, using the microbiome and what we know about that in order to improve human health. So a good place to start, what is the microbiome? So the definition of what a microbiome is, is a community of microorganisms such as bacteria, fungi and viruses that inhabit a particular environment and especially the collection of microorganisms living in or on the human body. So this is a, as I say, the sort of dictionary definition of what the microbiome is, but hopefully I'm going to explain in a bit more detail, uh, giving you a little bit more context. So the human microbiome is a very broad term, so I've given you the definition, but really different parts of the body all have very different and distinct communities of microbes. So we have an oral microbiome, so that refers to the microbes that are living in our mouth, and this is reported to be the second largest and diverse microbiota population in the human body after the gut. So I'm going to talk more about the gut as we go on. But the oral microbiome is involved in things like maintaining oral health, and it does have um, a big role in that. So the next thing, the skin microbiome. So our skin is home to millions of bacteria, fungi and viruses, hopefully not too many viruses. Um, but these comprise the skin microbiota. So skin microorganisms have an important role uh, in sort of the innate and adaptive arms of the cutaneous immune system. So if we think about it, the skin is often our first line of defence. So the microorganisms living on that skin play a role, a defensive role. Some skin diseases are associated with an altered microbial state on the surface of the skin. Um, I mean, on a personal note, in the current situation, uh, the amount I'm washing my hands at the moment, I'm actually not convinced that my hands have a microbiome anymore. They, they feel like they're completely sterile. Um, so, yes, the skin microbiome is, is a whole research field in itself. And I'm not really going to be going into that today, but just to make you aware that there are lots of different microbiomes. Um, we also have the genital tract, so the urogenital microbiome, and uh, that is the, again, the community of microbes which live around the genitals, so the vaginal um, microbiome. I will touch upon that a little bit um, because that can have an effect also on the gut microbiome in terms of uh, when a baby is born, but as I say, I'll talk about that a bit. So really what I'm focusing on today is the digestive tract microbiome, so this can be called the intestinal microbiome, the gut microbiome, less commonly the digestive tract microbiome, like on this diagram. Um, and that really is the area that I have put my focuses on. And so that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. So when we are talking about these microbes, microbes living in our body, often to people it can sound a bit strange, a bit scary, like something we probably don't want. Um, and I suppose it is a bit of a spectrum. So some pathogens, yes, they can be harmful, and they can, especially if they can get into the wrong place or they have the opportunity to largely increase in number. And we do see that as a problem in health. But actually, the human microbiome is incredibly important to our health in ways that we are still discovering. Um, and a lot of microbes we're finding out are very useful to the body. So to give a specific example, um, they can be useful in things like breaking down the large amount of sugars uh, that are found in human breast milk. So a baby, in this case, is not the one breaking down the sugars. It's the microbes 
assist in the baby. So the microbes in the baby's gut that assist it in breaking these down so that it can get the most out of them. So really, um, it's a big term microbes. There's lots of different types. Some can be harmful, but actually the microbiome as a whole is helping us in a lot of ways, uh, some of which we still we still don't fully understand or maybe even know. So talking specifically about the gut microbiome, exact numbers are hard to say. So these are really estimates, but as I said, what I've defined what the microbiome is, the gut microbiome is specifically the community of microbial cells which inhabit our intestine. And it's estimated that this could be up to 100 trillion microbial cells. And these come from over or around a thousand bacterial species, which are thought to encode for around 5 million genes. So, as I say, these numbers are estimates. Figures have been sort of banded around um, for years now, suggesting sort of how many microbial cells we have in our body. Obviously, we can't say for sure. Um, it was once sort of thought that we could have uh, microbial cells outnumbering our own cells by about 10 to 1. However, more recent studies in the, the last few years um, suggest that actually microbial cells and human cells coexist around the region of 1.3 to 1 ratio. So 1.3 microbial cells to every human cell. So they do outnumber us, or we think they probably do outnumber us, um, but less so than perhaps we originally thought. Um, although this isn't including viruses and viral particles, and obviously that can change quite a lot. Um, but nonetheless, whatever the numbers are, when we think of it like this, it seems a lot less surprising that these microbes could have a big effect on us as their host because we have a lot of them. If they're encoding for up to around 5 million genes, it's not that surprising that they are going to affect our health in some way. And so I'll talk a bit more about that now. So I'll talk about areas of health that we think the gut microbiome um, plays a role in. So I haven't got time to talk in detail about any of these areas, but this is just sort of an overview for you. And it's definitely not an exhaustive list. We're finding new areas um, of uh, the sort of microbiome's role in health all the time, but uh, here's some of them. So it looks like the microbiome can play a role in a vast array of health conditions, including things like obesity, mental health, immunity, allergies, certain types of cancer, digestive disease, and also diabetes. So we have good evidence to suggest that the microbiome is linked to these areas of health. However, the mechanisms by which the gut microbiome exerts these effects that is to say how the microbiome has an effect on any of these areas is not well understood. So this is a relatively new research field. Um, and by that, I mean, the majority of discoveries in this area have been made within the last 15 years. So that might sound like a long time, but actually, in terms of scientific research, it's a very new field. Therefore, as I say, we have good evidence to say that there are clear links between the microbiome and health, but we don't know the details of how this occurs, what the microbiome's role in health is. And this is really an important focus for scientists. Because once we understand these mechanisms, once we understand how the microbiome affects health, that is when we will know more about how we can manipulate or sort of alter the microbiome in order to improve health. So that's the big question. And it's a really massive task. But there is an awful lot of research going on. So I'm going to give an, an example now of one of those health areas. So one of them was obesity. So to do this, to give you this example, I want to just briefly introduce you to the germ-free mouse. So the, a really good way for us to carry out microbiome research, for scientists to carry out microbiome research, is to use germ-free mice. So these mice are bred in isolators which fully block exposure to microorganisms. Therefore, they don't have their own microbiome, hence they're germ-free. So they don't have that community of microbes living within their intestines. 
So this study, I think, is a fantastic example of just how powerful an effect the microbiome can have on, on obesity in this instance. So in this study, gut microbes were sampled, so taken from an obese mouse and transplanted into a germ-free mouse. And when this was carried out, that germ-free mouse that was given these obese well, gut microbes from an obese mouse then itself developed obesity, so it became obese. When a germ-free mouse was um, given the gut microbes of a lean mouse, that germ-free mouse remained lean. So in this study, gut microbes taken from an obese mouse transplanted, they resulted in the mouse becoming obese. So these experiments are carried out in a very carefully controlled environment so that all factors are, or at least should be, constant, so controlled for, with the only difference being the gut microbes transplanted, so whether they came from a lean or an obese donor mouse. So the fact that the transplantation of the obese mouse microbiome resulted in obesity suggests that the microbiome could play a big role in the development of obesity. So one thing that's very important to say is that these experiments are in mice, which is hopefully clear from this diagram, but it is important to state. So whilst these findings are very exciting and a great indicator of the potential role of the microbiome, they are not directly applicable to humans. We are very different to mice in a lot of ways. Um, however, when we look in humans, we're a lot harder to study than the germ-free mice. It's a lot harder to control for all of the variables in our lives, in our lives, and we, we can't really do that. But it is interesting to see that in humans, studies have observed that obese and lean individuals seem to have differences in their gut microbiome. So it seems that obese individuals tend to have a reduction in the diversity of the bacteria in their microbiome. So that's to say they have less different types of microbes in their microbiome. So whilst we're still in the early stages of characterising the microbiome, and at the moment we really don't know what makes the optimal microbiome, it does appear that generally the more diverse one's microbiome is, the better for their health. So now I'm sure we're all wanting to know how can we change our microbiome? What affects it? What alters the microbiome? So I'll go through um, a few of the uh, things that can play a role in the composition of an individual's microbiome. Again, this isn't an exhaustive list. I've just tried to cover the main ones. So firstly, genetics. So genetics plays a big role in health in general. Um, and in terms of the microbiome, family members are often observed to have more similar microbiotas than unrelated individuals. And whilst a lot of this can be attributed to them sharing an environment potentially, so they have the same diet, same sort of lifestyle, it does seem that there is a genetic determinant of the microbiome. However, this isn't the biggest factor in determining a microbiome. Environment is thought to be more influential than genetics. So the next thing to discuss is medicine. So a good example here is antibiotics. So I want to start by saying overall, antibiotics have saved millions of lives and are obviously invaluable to modern medicine. Um, however, when we look specifically at their effects on the microbiome, the use of antibiotics can heavily disrupt the ecology of the bacteria, the, the microbes living within the human body. And this can have a knock on effect on health. So I'll talk a little bit more about that um, towards the end. The next thing to talk about is birth methods. So sometimes if people have, don't really know a lot about the microbiome, they can be surprised by this. But the babies who are born by vaginal delivery, so um, they come through the, the mother's um, vagina and they, as they come out, they will take in some of the, microbi the microbes from the mother's vagina at birth. Whereas if a baby is born by C-section, as in this diagram, they will miss that, so they won't um, be in contact with the vaginal microbes. So this is suggested, um, it is suggested that this could be one of the reasons why babies born by caesarean section have a higher risk of conditions including asthma and type 1 diabetes. 
something else that affects the microbiome is age. So we know that the microbiome changes with age. As I just mentioned, the birth method affects it. And then as the baby grows up, the type of milk that it's receiving, so whether it's breast milk or formula, will have an effect on the microbiome. And then numerous factors in childhood, so diet, hygiene, siblings, pets, allergies, illnesses, antibiotics, these will all affect a child's microbiome. And again, these things will still continue to influence the microbiome into adulthood. And something else that's been observed is that the diversity of the microbiome does seem to decline with age. So if you remember, I said that it does seem that the more diverse a microbiome is, the better for health. It does seem that the diversity reduces with age. But really, the microbiome is always changing. It's never really static. It's always sort of um, responding to changes in our environment and our health status. The next thing is hygiene. So unsurprisingly, our hygiene has an effect on microbes entering the body. Right now, we are more aware than ever of the effect and the importance of hand washing on things entering our body. Um, you know, this has never been more talked about. And of course, at the moment, we're thinking about this in the context of viruses. Uh, one virus in particular, um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So, you know, we know that, that washing our hands, hygiene has a big effect on what's entering our bodies. And this has always been known um, scientifically, of course. Um, however, you know, we're applying it to viruses a lot at the moment, but the same applies to bacteria. So our hygiene will influence the bacteria present in our microbiome. And like I said a few slides back, the bacteria, the, the microbes present in a microbiome aren't always a bad thing. Um, and not all bacteria are pathogens. But of course, at the moment, we all need to be washing our hands. Um, it would be interesting to see the effect that all of this is having on our microbiome, actually. But So finally, I've left this one to last because it is the main influence on the microbiome composition, and that's diet. So diet plays a significant role in shaping the microbiome. And studies show that alterations in the diet can induce induce large uh, temporary microbial shifts even within 24 hours so it, it can be quite quick to affect um, our microbiome and all sorts of nutrients or types of food so things like protein and indeed the specific type of protein uh, fat and the type of fat carbohydrates fiber and also supplements which i'll touch upon a bit later these things will all affect the composition of an individual's microbiome So I know now that I've given you a brief introduction, uh, you might want to go away and do a bit of your own reading uh, on this area uh, of the areas that interest you. So before you do that, I thought it might be helpful if I go through a few key terms that you might hear when you're reading about the microbiome and health and just give you a little definition of what each of them means. So first of all, um, something that you've probably heard of are probiotics. And if you haven't heard of the term probiotics, you've probably seen them on the shelves. So the definition is that they are live microorganisms, which when administered in adequate amounts, confer a health benefit on the host. So that's the World Health Organization's definition. Now, a lot of these products will contain an active um, or live microorganism. However, they may not be labelled as probiotics and that is because of that second part of the definition when we say when administered in adequate amounts it must confer a health benefit on the host in order to be called a probiotic and um, so that is something that is regulated by the European Food Safety Authority and so at the moment as things stand no specific health claims have been permitted by the European Food Safety Authority or EFSA as we call it um, in relation to probiotics. So actually, in this country, we don't have things labelled as probiotics. So the use of the word probiotic to describe products for sale in the European Union isn't permitted. But there is some promising evidence for the potential health benefits of probiotics. However, we need a lot of research to be carried out in order to show a sort of cause and effect to be able to say that they are beneficial to health. So the general advice at the moment is that from the UK Department of Health uh, is that for most people, probiotics 
do appear to be safe. We can't promise that they do have a beneficial effect, but they are at least safe for most people. So there is some evidence to suggest that there are beneficial effects on probiotics. And I'd say this, um, we need to keep doing research in order to, to show this more conclusively. However, um, sort of an early research focus on gastrointestinal conditions is leading to some sort of promising advances that may suggest that probiotics improve symptoms of certain things such as ulcerative colitis, acute gastroenteritis, and also irritable bowel syndrome, so IBS. So moving on to prebiotics, so these two terms you could almost be forgiven for thinking that they're the same thing if, if it wasn't something you knew a lot about, um, but they are two distinct things. So prebiotics are non-digestible food ingredients that probiotics can feed off. So probiotics are the live microorganisms, whereas prebiotics are sort of the food for those. So they are used in the gut to increase populations of healthy bacteria, and they can also aid digestion and enhance the production of valuable vitamins. So they're available um, in supplemental form, but also they can be found in a wide variety of foods um, generally uh, vegetables and um, green leafy vegetables. So they're a type of fibre, essentially. Something else you might come across is the term symbiotics. So these are food ingredients or supplements that combine both pro and prebiotics. So in terms of research, pro and prebiotics tend to be studied separately in, in the earlier stages of research. And this is common in science, so to study individual components um, so that we can understand which effects are caused by prebiotics and which are caused by probiotics. But I suppose if you think about it in terms of the probiotics being the live organisms and the prebiotics being the food for those live organisms that can help them grow and flourish, you can see how it could be a good idea potentially to ensure that you have both in your diet if they do indeed confer a health benefit. So if, if probiotics were to um, result in a health benefit, it would be useful to be able to feed those probiotics with prebiotics. So having a supplement which combines all in one could be beneficial for certain individuals. So something else, I've already mentioned this briefly, um, is antibiotics. So these are a medicine that inhibit the growth of or destroy microorganisms. So they can be quite non-selective. So what, what by that, what I mean is they will destroy or kill microorganisms. They won't just select the bad ones that we want to get rid of and kill those. They can have a big effect on the whole microbiome. Um, so when antibiotics kill off a lot of the bacteria in our digestive tract, it can sometimes cause problems. Now, as I said before, that's not to say that the antibiotics are a bad thing. They've saved millions of lives over the years. However, we, we are starting to learn more about the microbiome and the effects it can have on those. And when they do kill off a lot of the bacteria, as I say, it can sometimes cause problems and we get certain sort of opportunistic bacteria that can then start to flourish and cause illness. And so this is what happens with um, Clostridium difficile. So this is also known as C. difficile or C. diff. And this is a bacteria that can infect the bowel and cause diarrhea. And this infection most commonly affects people who have recently been treated with antibiotics. So it seems that what, when the antibiotics kill off a lot of the bacteria, this um, C. diff sort of is opportunistic and, and takes over and increases in amount. So there's been some interesting research um, in the use of probiotics as an adjunctive therapy with antibiotics. So what that means is using probiotics at the same time, so in adjunct um, as antibiotics. And this has been shown, um, there's good evidence to suggest that this can reduce the risk of uh, C. diff infections and also um, C. diff associated diarrhea as well as antibiotic associated diarrhea. So this is sometimes uh, prescribed to patients um, 
say probiotics are sometimes recommended to use in addition um sort of at the same time as as antibiotics in order to prevent the likelihood of a C. diff infection. Another term you might come across is the term dysbiosis. So this is often defined as an imbalance in the gut microbial community. That is itself, this imbalance can be associated with disease. So this is sort of a way to say that the, the microbial community has been disrupted somehow, it's, it's out of balance and this can cause ill health. So the thing with this definition is it's quite loose. So what I mean by this is the problem we have with it is we don't really know exactly or we, we definitely don't know exactly what makes a microbiome healthy. So we know that we think that diversity um, is, a, is a benefit in the microbiome, but we don't know which specific microbes uh, how many of each, we, we, we just don't have the answers into what makes or what constitutes the perfect microbiome, the optimal microbiome. So if we don't know this, then we don't really know exactly what makes a microbiome unhealthy. So it's, it's a definition for an imbalanced microbiome that's associated with disease. However, to diagnose that would be a lot trickier. We don't know exactly what that looks like in terms of microbiome which is a shame because obviously, you know, being able to diagnose these things makes treatment a lot easier. So hopefully that's given you a reasonable overview of what the microbiome is and the potential areas of health that it could be involved with. So what's next? So really, uh, at the moment, um, the scope of clinical conditions that are affected by the microbiome is very broad. And we are in you know, the early days of this research, it's very much in its infancy. So, you know, the the next steps really are more and more research. So to determine the mechanisms underpinning the role of the microbiome in health. So yes, we know that it seems to have an effect, but why? What is happening? What is causing that effect? Once we can figure that out, it will it will sort of lead to a lot more potential therapies. So defining the characteristics of what makes. So if we knew what was uh, an optimal microbiome, what an optimal microbiome looked like, we would then be able to identify um, what a suboptimal microbiome looks like and potentially do a diagnostic test to decide whether we need to intervene to sort of restore the microbiota if we did find that it was suboptimal. So to end, um, I suppose I wanted to give you a bit of good news, because I know that there's a lot of unknowns in everything I've just spoken about. But the good news is that at the moment, um, the current research would suggest that a varied and balanced healthy diet would lead to the most favourable gut microbiome. So the good news is we're not asking you to do anything different, basically. So the diet is covered here in the Eat Well Guide. And this is not only recommended as a fav as a, as favorable to the health of the microbiome, but also this this diet we know um, reduces the risk of overweight and obesity, um, metabolic disease, heart disease, and certain types of cancer, to name a few. So really carrying on in line with current guidance about eating your five a day, making sure you get the balances of um, macronutrients correct really is the best um, in terms of micro, the microbiome as well as general health. So pro and prebiotics are readily available. There's not enough evidence to say that they are necessarily um, of benefit to health in healthy individuals, but they can be incorporated into the diet safely for most individuals. Thank you very much for listening and take care.